Well, I'm delighted to be joined now by Jennifer Palmer from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who's going to be discussing African sleeping sickness in post-conflict southern Sudan. Jennifer, thank you very much for joining us today. Sure. Now, first of all, Jennifer, you're going to be presenting a poster session at the conference about African sleeping sickness. Tell us a bit about it. Why is it so devastating? Um, well, sleeping sickness um, caused by a parasite called trypanosome, uh, it's only found in Africa where uh, the vector of the disease, the tsetse fly, lives. Um, and the type of sleeping sickness that I'm studying, Gambiense, uh, is the kind that causes over 95% of infections in Africa. Um, and they, the most endemic countries in the world are also the ones dealing with a post-conflict context. Southern Sudan, where I'm doing the study, is the third most endemic country in Africa. Um, and sleeping sickness within countries is incredibly geographically focal, meaning it's not all over the country. It's only in very small areas where the tsetse fly can live. Um, so in the, the place where I'm doing the study, in a place called Nimile, uh, it's about 1% prevalence, meaning that um, 1% of people in the population have an infection that will be fatal within three years unless they get access to testing and treatment. So why is it so devastating? What are some of the symptoms? It affects your blood. Um, it looks a lot like other more common diseases such as malaria or typhoid. Um, it causes fever and aches and pains. But when it goes into your brain, that's when it goes into stage two and that's when you get to see the very specific symptoms such as uh, changes in your sleep-wake cycle. So you get people um, sleeping excessively during the daytime and awake at night. You also get behavioral changes and neurological changes. So you get anything from convulsions, paralysis, to hallucinations, um, and general behavior change. So it's, it's quite a dramatic disease, um, and it, it affects both the patient, the family, and, and the community because of how ill a patient gets, but also how they change their behavior. Now I understand with your PhD you're looking to develop a new strategy to tackle this disease. Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, well it actually came out of a more descriptive study that I was doing, um, studying a, a program run by Merlin, which is a medical, a British medical NGO um, that's running a sleeping sickness control program in southern Sudan. Um, and I was looking at some of the, the barriers that patients face getting access to testing and the problems that providers have in, in connecting patients to that test so that they can get treatment for the fatal disease. Um, and one of the problems that we found was that health workers um, from peripheral healthcare facilities, so outside of the hospital where the screening center, the test is offered, um, they were not participating as much as they could in community referral networks. Most of the work of connecting patients to the test was being done by patients and communities themselves or by staff health workers at the hospital. Um, so we decided to try and target a training intervention to um, improve the knowledge that peripheral health workers have of the signs and symptoms of sleeping sickness so that they can actually refer patients to the hospital to get a test and treatment if they need it. Um, this may seem like quite an obvious thing to do, train health workers to recognize signs of disease, but actually um, if you read the literature, no one has ever reported doing this. So this is um, some, something, a strategy that we're trying to do um, and we think that is appropriate to the post-conflict context where health workers have been denied training opportunities for decades um, and there aren't a lot of resources to be able to do more active screening approaches where you actually send um, teams out into communities. Um, that approach is, is very good for disease control, but it, it costs money, so we're looking at, at other ways to try and accomplish disease control objectives and save lives. Now you've touched on healthcare workers there a bit. Why are they so key in all of this? Yeah. Uh, well, they can support uh, patients to get to the hospital. Uh, right now, the situation is um, that if patients realize that they are sick, sick enough to treat care, um, and then decide to go to the hospital, then health workers at that point, um, once they're in the hospital, can help point them towards a sleeping sickness test. But if they go to seek treatment from health workers any time um, earlier on that treatment seeking pathway before they get to the hospital, right now what we're seeing is that health workers that they encounter on the way just don't know the signs and symptoms of sleeping sickness. And before we did the intervention, I interviewed health workers and they told me they didn't even know that there was 
a screening program in the, in the hospital that is in their region. Um, so this seemed like a really important uh, intervention to introduce in this context. And finally, Jennifer, why are conferences like the Canadian Conference on Global Health so important for, for giving a platform for your work? Well, actually, the sleeping sickness research world is quite small, actually. Sleeping sickness is a neglected disease, uh, meaning it doesn't get a lot of attention from funders and, and media until today. <laughs> um, and so there aren't a lot of people sort of within our circle um, to, for me to really learn from and share the, the news. So I'm hoping that um, a platform like CSIH will allow me to share the research and discuss more with uh, people who really have an interest in this disease. Well, it's a fascinating topic, Jennifer. Best of luck with the conference. Thanks.